<laughs> All right, Daniel, the seventh chapter. <clears throat> and so what we looked at last week was verses 1 through 14. And as I mentioned before, um, what's taking place here is Daniel, excuse me, the king has had these dreams in the past. And um, the, what would happen after these dreams? What happened in chapter 2 after, um, and in chapter 4 for that matter, after Nebuchadnezzar has a dream? Does he sleep well after that? No. No, uh, if you ever had a dream that wakes you up, and normally nightmare, right? Wakes you up and you just can't go back to sleep. That's where, that's where Nebuchadnezzar was after these dreams, right? He, he just is troubled, he can't go back to sleep. And Daniel comes in each time and he gives some interpretation. Now the premise of the book of Daniel is these people, God's people, are in exile, right? And... The purpose of Daniel is to preach two things. Faithfulness, the answer is faithfulness to God amongst all these struggles. And secondly, the theme is hope. And in fact, in all these dreams, uh, you see all this horrible stuff happening. And what God is saying through the dreams and through Daniel is, I'm in control. And here's how it's going to end. Here's what's going to take place, right? And so it's, it's this encouraging aspect. What we see in Daniel 7, in fact, throughout the rest of the book, is Daniel has dreams. And what we're going to see, I, I won't ask you, because even if you read ahead, you, which I hope you did, I hope you've read Daniel a couple times by now, but even if you read ahead, you very well could have missed this point. Daniel has these dreams, and he is troubled. In fact, we saw that last week. He falls down before the angel, and next week he's going to fall down before Gabriel, the angel. He's troubled. But even when the interpretation is given to him, he is still troubled. And, and that's a message throughout the book. Now, those two concepts of faithfulness and hope are still the theme. But we're going to see a slightly different take or from a different perspective um, as we look at these, these dreams. Questions or comments on the overview or anything we looked at last week, the setting of, of Daniel 7. So, <clears throat> last week in Daniel 7, Daniel has this dream, and four beasts come out of where? This is important. What started to get stirred, and then one beast after another came out of it? The sea. We talked about the significance of that last week. Out of the sea, these beasts are coming, and they're horrible beasts, right? Um, they are terrific in, they, in a horrible way they're they're scary and one after another in fact these first three come out and then the fourth comes out and he's I mean he's got teeth of iron and what he doesn't devour he tramps underfoot right and man he's just he's trouble that that has significance to me because um, rodeo and when I was young you know, everyone looks at bulls. And what are you afraid of when you look at a bull? Someone tell me. The horns. Guess what? The horns aren't the scary part. <laughs> it's the hooves. I promise you, it's the hooves, right? Everyone gets concerned about the about uh, horns, but it's, it's the hooves. And I think of this fourth beast because what he doesn't devour. He tramples underfoot. And, Wow, that's devastating. I know, I know it is on behalf of large animals. Um, and, and so we're going to look at that fourth beast. But with all this terror going on, Daniel looks, and while this is happening, what takes place in, this, in the sky? What or who ends up sitting on his throne? See, I gave you that much. A big throne come place in the sky. Yes, thank you, Shirley. The Ancient of Days. 
the ancient of days sits and, and he's above everything else, right? That's part of the imagery. He's above everything else. And while he's there and we have this beautiful judgment because he calls a trial, a judgment, verse 10, and court sat in judgment and the books were open. The Ancient of Days is sitting in judgment over the, the beast, over the entire world. And who's presented to him? That's found in 13 and 14. Charlie's got it again. The Son of Man. Right? The Son of Man comes before him. And so where we spent a lot of time last week is we looked at that Son of Man. Um, and we looked how Jesus used it and how Jesus looked at this overall concept. And I, I think Jesus does two things. I, I ran short on time last week. And so I ended it by saying this. Jesus in Matthew 26, he says to the, um, to the high priest who says, Are you... The son of God, or, or, or are you the Christ? He's asking many different regard, or different ways. And after Jesus says, you've said it, he then goes, but I will tell you this. Jesus is refusing to answer the question. And the high priest says, I adjure you by the power of God. Tell me. He says, here's what I'll tell you. From henceforth, or from now on, you will see the son of man coming in the clouds. I shared with you last week, my life, that what we, the reaction we see is kind of puzzling when we just look at Matthew 26 ourselves. The reason it's puzzling for us is because we don't know our Bibles as well as the, the high priest and all, everyone around them. Now, I say that generally. I'm saying that of myself, right? They understood what Jesus is saying. He's quoting, he's referencing this passage. And so the implication is, to the high priest, that when you convict me guilty, it's you that's found guilty because I'm the son of man, you're part of the beast. Now, I left it there. Because when we look at what the beast is, I think it's pretty clear that fourth beast to me, and again, I'm, I could pull that Facebook page back up, but to me it's pretty clear it's the Roman government. Who, who is in control of even the Jewish hierarchy at that time? The Roman government. The high priest that Jesus is sitting in front of was appointed, not by the Old Testament law, but by Roman government. Who do these very individuals appeal to have Jesus crucified? The Roman government, right? Right? Um, here's the point I stopped short of making. I don't think Jesus is saying to the high priest, you are the beast, or you alone are the beast. He's bringing out this concept that there can be particular details or particular truths, and then there's general truths. In other words, can these beasts represent specific nations in specific time in history? Yes. But do they also represent a more general concept? That this is how the government of men works when it's not ruled by godliness. Yes. And so circular, secular. Uh, Linda's mentioned to me um, um, you know, about this book of Daniel. It's, it's so hard. You, know, you see them turn to God and then away from God and to God. And you're right, Linda, but what's even more difficult than seeing that in Daniel to me, yeah, and not just by those people, but by this people, right? Um, that's what's difficult, and that's one of the concepts that Jesus is bringing out. When you're violating, when you're going against the role of God and the principles of God, the spirit of God, you're part of the beast. I think that's an important principle to grasp when we start 
grasping or, or dealing with um, uh, the book of Revelation, right? When we start thinking about the beast and things. Go ahead. Uh, Daniel, like you said, they're in and out of God's uh, grace. And then they're back into the sin. And then they're back there crying for God again. And they're only in there a short time. And then they're back in again. And we, was, we read Daniel last night, being ready for class. And after we read it, she says, Did you understand that? I says, No. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so I think that's something that I'm really trying to appeal to is the details can be very difficult and take a lot of digging. And even then, I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 13. Um, for now we see through a grass darkly, but then face to face. So uh, the details, even with a lot of study, we can still disagree and it's still a little bit dark. But these general concepts are very clear, can be very clear and helpful and applicable to our lives. So I, that's a point, Bob, I think you illustrated really well for us, that, that those details are, can be difficult. All right, so those, we had that dream. Now let's interpret that dream. And this can be clear because, well, it's not my interpretation, right? It's, it's God's interpretation to, to Daniel. Um, would someone read 15 through 18 for us? As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made me... or. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Okay, thank you. So right here, if we get nothing else, this 15 through 18 is what to grasp a hold of. Here's the point of it all. And so it's easy for us, especially being we hit the pause button and looked at other passages last week and then let a whole week to go by. It's hard for us to understand or to remember that Daniel is still in this vision. So in 15, it says, as for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. How many of you have ever struggled with that? No one? Half of you are Smiths. <laughs> we tend to be anxious people, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, your spirit is anxious. Daniel says, I, I was on edge, right? I, I was stirred inside. And what I'd just seen alarmed me. It scared him. Put him on edge. I approached one of those who stood there. Now, where are we standing? I think to see where we're standing is this whole vision of 9 through 10 with the Ancient of Days appeared in the sky and, and he's surrounded and honored and then the Son of Man's presented to him. He's approaching in this vision someone who's standing witnessing this with them. And he says, what's all this mean? The implication is it's an angel, right? It's someone in the vision. It's part of the heavenly host. And so 16 says, I approached one of those who stood there and asked them the truth concerning all this. Isn't this interesting how the, the, the plot twist you know, like I mentioned before earlier, Nebuchadnezzar has these dreams and he has no way to, um, to solve them and he's anxious. Now, here's an important aspect for all of us. You know, sometimes we think we, we get the answer, right? And, and here's a principle that more and more that I'm embracing in, in my life, maybe just because I'm not intelligent enough to be doing anything other. But, you know, we have these puzzles in our lives. 
and in the church, we've oftentimes said, well, you know, search the scripture so you can get the answer. Here's my answer where I've started to write. I'll never have the answer. <laughs> God always has the answer. So even when I think I've got it all figured out, the answer still belongs to God, right? So Daniel comes before Nebuchadnezzar, and remember, he says this twice to him. He says, no one can interpret this dream. Only God. That's an important principle because now Daniel's got this dream and he can't interpret it. If he was able to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, he could interpret his own dream. But he can't. And he couldn't. So Daniel knows where to go to find the answer. It's to the heavenly host, right? He says, so what's this mean? So he told me, made known to me the interpretation of things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. What was happening is these beasts were trampling the saints. He says, these beasts are kingdoms. But ultimately, the kingdom, the kingdom will be given to the saints forever and ever and ever. Um, that's the message. That's why there's hope, right? Uh, one of the reasons is Christians, I think, and we're talking today, our final lesson on purpose of the church today is the final lesson on that. Um, but when we lose our purpose, when we lose sight of what we're about, we become like everyone else. We become trampled by the beast. We become victims. We come, become people groping for power, right? which is what everyone else in the world does. When we understand this principles... Paul said this in Romans 8. Though you're going, this is loose, loose paraphrase. <laughs> Though you're going to the slaughter like sheep, through all this you're more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Why? They were in the kingdom. It was theirs to possess. We're going to see in 1 Peter Ernie's downstairs teaching, at least he's supposed to be, <laughs> We're going to assume that's where he is. Uh, he's going to read for us um, from First Peter, the third chapter. And um, there, Peter says, if you're so zealous to do good, who can do you harm? When you understand your mission, your purpose, and your inheritance... You're conquerors. You're not victims. That's, I think, the primary message from, from this short interpretation. And then we'll look at the, the broader interpretation. Amount. Questions, Corey? Yeah, so it's um, the, the implication is it's an angel. It's one of the heavenly hosts. So he still... We, like I said, we, we departed from the vision for an entire week. Daniel's still in this vision. So in verses 9 through 10, we have this heavenly host, and God opens, where the Ancient of Days, to be literal, the Ancient of Days opens judgment or trial. And in the trial, the Son of Man is brought uh, to him. It's in that context that Daniel's still looking at the, the vision, and he turns to one standing watching the vision with them, and says, what does all this mean? So it, it's hard for us, again, I, you know, we stopped there last week, and we're a whole week, and it's almost like Daniel now is a week later, and he says, hey, what did this mean? No, he's still in that vision. Okay. It's a great question. Any other questions or comments? 
Would someone read uh, then 19 through, um, let's stop at 22. 19 through 22. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, breaking pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of the horn that had eyes, and the mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellow. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, <coughs> until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And, that, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thank you. So, as I mentioned before, Daniel asks, hey, what does this mean? And he's given us overall vision. Here's what's important. But Daniel's just like you, right? In this way. And just like me. He, he's, he says, yeah, but what about this? You know, um, uh, oh, yeah, and it, is it John that tells about the lady brought in adultery and Jesus writes in the sand? I think that's John, right? just left me. I hope so. The, the point will remain the same which regardless, even though I, I'm exhibiting my ignorance um, or forgetfulness, whichever way you want to look at. Uh, Jesus, the Gospel writer, gives us this wonderful story, right? And then what's the first question we ask? What did you write in the sand? <laughs> right. Now, Daniel is given this beautiful picture, and he says, yeah, but this beast that's unlike the other three, this horrible beast, tell me about him. Um, and, and he goes on to re-explain what is taking place. And um, the angel says, hey, he's going to prevail. He's going to kill until the ancient days in judgment sets them down. Right? Now, interesting point, and you may agree or disagree with this, but regardless, either way, it should be a, something to think about. We tend to think of the pinnacle of time as the second coming of Christ. Right? And, and I believe that we do that because we put such an emphasis on heaven. Like that's our goal in life. Jesus described the pinnacle of time very differently. In fact, he, he uses essentially that phrase. The pinnacle of time in the time of judgment is at hand. Does anyone recall when he said that? It's about two days before he's crucified. He's standing in the temple. This is the pinnacle of time. You see, your blessing as a Christian, Daniel's blessing as a man of God, was not that he would die. It was that he could live and was living for God and having an impact and is still having an impact today. The kingdom comes after the resurrection of Christ. And saints are ushered through that door. Right? To do what? To demonstrate what God on earth looks like. What was meant to be all 
what it was meant to be from the beginning. This last beast is going to do horrible things. Even, you know, if you think about the Roman government and the persecution that takes place. The saints in Revelation 5 are calling out from under the throne saying, How long? How long? God's answer is unsatisfactory to us. <laughs> Longer. Be quiet. <laughs> you say, whoa, I look at that and I'm like, that's so different from the character of God everywhere else. Scripture. No, it isn't. Because the message is the victory's already been gained. You're going to see it play out. And so amongst all the horrible things that takes place, the message is, even now, to Daniel, the battle's already won. Right? This is how it's going to play out. Here's what takes place. Questions, comments, before we read the, the long quote about, about that fourth beast. Um, would someone read 23 through 27 then, because we're going to leave 28. To all by itself. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms. And it shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of his, this kingdom ten kings shall rise, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the, fourth, for the former one, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out of the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and a half time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom of the dominion and the greatness of the king kingdoms under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and the dominions shall serve and obey him. Do you want me to read 28? Mike? Nope. Thank you. Perfect, Bob. Um, so, here we have this fourth beast. Now, there are tons and tons and tons of writings on who the ten kings are, who the three put down are, and, you know, all this um, most um, within our fellowship at least um, look at this as the Roman emperors and um, the year of the the four emperors and there's all kinds of things that take place and if you're interested in that reading there's lots of reading out some put this about something still gonna happen there's lots there's even TV shows made about that that you can watch if you want like all this stuff, right, that we can argue and, and talk about and miss this point. And this is the point for Daniel. Now, there's another side, Daniel, we're going to deal with in 28. But this is the message to Daniel. Tell me if I'm wrong on this part. All these four beasts, Daniel, they don't matter. Is that not what God says? They don't matter. Now, is that a quote? <laughs> you can keep searching for those words. You'll, you'll never find them except in, in Mike 2.13, right? Um, but the point is, why don't they matter? The kingdom. Like, these kingdoms come, they do their damage, they do their harm, they tear things up, and then they die. And then another comes and tears them up. But amongst all of this, Daniel 2 and 44 talks about the meteor that comes out. There's going to arise God's kingdom that will devour all other kingdoms. That's why it doesn't matter. We're going to be given a spiritual kingdom that reigns through all this. There's... This really, 
really important idea about God's kingdom. When the Syrians conquered the northern kingdom, what they did is they took millions and millions of people out of Judea or out of Israel, northern kingdom, and brought millions of people in. Does anyone know the purpose of that or why that was done? To destroy culture. It worked effectively. The closest thing in the northern kingdom that we have at the time of Christ is the Samaritans. Right? The Babylonians did things a little bit different. And the Romans, I think, are even a better example of this. The Romans incorporated people. They said, you keep your culture as long as it doesn't interfere with the Roman government. You can be your own people. Just pay us your money and obey yourselves, right? My point is, culture is this incredibly strong force. The spiritual kingdom, what did Paul say? There's neither Jew nor Greek. He's talking about race. He's talking about culture. He's talking about preferences, right? It transcends all of that. Something's really interesting. I had a missionary tell me this a, a, few, a couple of years ago. He said, you know, Mike, in the church, we claim that, you know, we teach nothing but Jesus. And he says, but something really started to bother me. I was in these foreign countries that don't speak English. And, and you go into these little congregations. And he says, you know what's at the front of every one of them? A table just like that. With in English, in English, in remembrance of me. <laughs> did we leave our culture? No, we did. Now, does that, does that, am I, am I bashing missionaries? No, no, not at all. My point is that Dad, God's point is this kingdom's going to consume all other kingdoms. You can't get rid of it. The harder you try to trample it, the more it springs up. Because there is no Jew or Greek, there is no free or slave, there is no male or female. It's greater and all that. Now let me end very quickly because this is an important part. Verse 28, Bob wanted to read it so bad. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. When we read in Peter and really alluded to strongly in Hebrews about this idea that we have what prophets and angels have longed to see throughout the ages. I think about Daniel. He's sick to his stomach. In fact, we see in the next chapter, he lays in bed for days sick because he can't bear to think about it. The reason being... God says, it's not time yet. You wait. You wait. But brothers and sisters, it's been given to you and to me. That's amazing. Thank you.